Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Byron Community Church. We are so glad that you've decided to join us on YouTube or on the podcast for our Sunday service here on September 13th. You've picked a good Sunday to join us because we begin our new fall study entitled Rebuild Life Lessons from Nehemiah. Now, over to Pastor John. Pastor Watson was visiting a family in his congregation, the Millers. Uh, the Millers had a uh, parrot, a pet parrot, a female parrot, and instead of saying, Pull on a cracker, the parrot would always say, Let's kiss! Let's kiss! Let's kiss! Well, this was quite embarrassing, and uh, during the visit, everyone did their best to ignore the parrot, but eventually the husband, Mr. Miller, said, Pastor, we've got a problem. He said, as you've heard, our parrot is always saying, let's kiss, let's kiss. And he said, uh, it's, it's embarrassing, it's frustrating, it's, it's a very distressing situation. He said, do you think you could help us fix this problem? Well, Pastor Watson paused and then replied, well, yes, I think I can. And he said, I have, a, I have a parrot, a male parrot. And then he paused again and then somewhat piously boasted, he is quite spiritual. He's a very spiritual parrot. All he says is, let's pray, let's pray. He said, I think if you were to bring your parrot over to my place, my parrot would be a positive influence on your parrot, and I think that would fix the problem. So the next day, the Millers brought their parrot over to the pastor's home, and they put the two parrots in a cage. And sure enough, the Millers' female parrot cried out, Let's kiss! Let's kiss! And the pastor's spiritual parrot replied, Hallelujah! My prayers have been answered! <laughs> oh, I, I do enjoy that story. And you know, sometimes um, it's not as easy fixing problems as it uh, initially appears. Uh, you know, 2020, who would have thought in July that we would have a year like 2020? Problems persist all around us. Uh, cascading conflicts are unrelenting. There's breakdowns, there's difficulties, there's uncertainty, there's brokenness. Brokenness seems everywhere. Uh, COVID-19, this despicable pandemic has caused illnesses and death. Because of it, there are many stores and restaurants that have closed permanently. There's more people than we can imagine that are out of work. Uh, COVID-19 has been very difficult, but added to our predicament, uh, there's division. There is polarization in our world like we've never seen before in our lifetime. And brokenness we can see in human relationships. Think of marriage. Many marriages have soured during this pandemic. They are crippled by unrelenting pressure and stress. Mental health issues are soaring and all of us to some degree are wrestling with this uh, pandemic. We have COVID-19 fatigue. It's been a really difficult year, riddled with uncertainty. In fact, just the other day, a, a pastor friend of mine took his 2020 day timer. The start of the year, he had scheduled all kinds of, of events and activities. Well, he took that day timer the other day, threw it in a fire pit in his backyard, and burned it. Um, I mean, the only thing that seems certain 
in 2020 is uncertainty. Now, I know some of you are saying, but John, there have been some blessings. There have been some positives. And uh, I would agree, and, 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 and like you, I am, I'm grateful for these blessings. Uh, we are grateful that Byron Community Church has managed to survive and thrive during this pandemic. But when I think of the start of 2020, back in January, and we were experiencing such wonderful momentum as a church, I, I must confess, I am uh, disappointed, I am frustrated that we have lost that in-person dynamic that we were experiencing at the beginning of the year. And maybe as a result of pandemic, uh, you have found yourself struggling uh, in your relationship with the Lord. Maybe there is growing distance between, between you and God. Uh, you know, during your exile from the church building and church programs, it can be difficult to maintain a healthy spirituality. Yeah, we acknowledge that there are many positives and, and blessings, but as I've said, this is a, a very difficult time. And at such a time as this, we are all looking for renewed hope. We need encouragement. We need to be inspired to fix, to restore, and even to rebuild our broken world. A broken world, kind of like a broken wall. For that reason, I think it's appropriate this fall, how ironic, this fall, to begin a series that I've titled Rebuild, Life Lessons from Nehemiah. And today we're going to start with a message entitled and with apology to those of you who are fans of the rock band Pink Floyd, not just another brick in the wall. So we're going to start our series with just a few introductory comments. Uh, Nehemiah, we're going to be thinking a lot about Nehemiah this fall. He was a man who encountered many problems, difficulties, and brokenness in his world. But he was a man who became a builder. He made a difference in his world. And Nehemiah models for us what it is uh, and how you and I can rebuild and can fix some of the problems in, in, in our world. But not only do we pick up life lessons from Nehemiah, but I also want to emphasize God's unfolding plan of redemption. This is a, uh, a, a emphasis that often is overlooked when sermons and series deal with Nehemiah. As much as that ancient Bible character, Nehemiah, is the star of the story, he's a star because he followed, he was a believer in the God of history. So we want to make sure there is a, a good synergy between those two focus points. But you do need to know we will look at some very practical life lessons, looking at issues from Nehemiah. Uh, some of these issues I'm calling bricks in the wall. So we're going to be looking at some uh, topics like leadership, like uh, teamwork, how we can overcome opposition, the keys to spiritual revival. We'll be looking at the secret to perseverance. But today we want to look at the starting point, where rebuilding for Nehemiah began, uh, where it needs to start for you and me. And so today we want to look at building block number one, building brick number one, the priority and the power of prayer. Now, another introductory matter has to do with history, giving a little bit of context to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's memoirs. Now, I know for some of you, when you hear that word history, already you're looking at fast-forwarding through this part of the sermon. 
but bear with me. It really is important to give us some context. We're told at the end of Nehemiah chapter 1 that Nehemiah was a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. Now, a cupbearer uh, was responsible for sampling the wine, for tasting the food before the king ate it, making sure it was safe. But a cupbearer was more than that. It was a very prestigious position in the palace. Nehemiah was like the chief assistant. He was the right-hand man of the king. He was in a very powerful and influential position. Well, how did an ordinary Jewish guy end up in such a prestigious position? Let's briefly look at a Jewish perspective on the history at that time. You might recall that at one point, uh, Israel were led by judges. They were the rulers. But the people wanted a king like the other nations. They selected King Saul. He was a disaster. King Saul was followed by God's choice, King David. The infamous King David. Those were the glory days of Israel. King David and then his son Solomon, responsible for building a wonderful wall around Jerusalem, a great uh, fortress city, uh, for uh, building the temple. These were wonderful days in Israel. But Solomon didn't finish well. Toward the end of his reign, uh, there was great disobedience in Israel. Uh, people were disobeying uh, God's commands. There was intermarriage with other nations. It, it wasn't a, a matter of, of interracial issues. That's never a problem, but this was interfaith marriages that God prohibited. Uh, people generally were violating God's law, and that led to division. So you ended up with this complicated arrangement, sometimes confusing for us, where the northern kingdom and southern kingdom split. The northern kingdom, you had ten tribes of Israel, uh, and, and they were known as Israel. The southern kingdom, there were two tribes known as Judah, and the capital city of Judah was Jerusalem. Now let's pick it up from the perspective of the other nations at, that, at this time. The uh, mighty Assyrians uh, conquered and took over the northern kingdom. And then the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar uh, struck and attacked Jerusalem in Judah. And not only did they destroy the temple and the wall of Jerusalem, but they took many, many Israelites captive and, and, and took them to Babylon. You remember the story of Daniel, and there were others who were taken captive into, uh, into Babylon. Well, the Babylonians, you had Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and many other leaders, they eventually were attacked by the Persians. The Persians, the mighty Persians, had an alliance with the Medes, so sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the Medes and the Persians. And uh, one of the very first kings was King Cyrus, and he very uh, generously uh, gave the opportunity for some Jewish people to, to uh, almost like a second exodus back from Babylonian, uh, Babylonian, uh, Babylonia to, to Jerusalem. And uh, you had this first wave of, of exiles, and they were led by King, or, or the leader, Zerubbabel. What a name, eh? Zerubbabel. A uh, hundred years later, there was a second wave of Jews returning to Jerusalem, and, and they uh, left under the priest Ezra. Often we connect Ezra and Nehemiah, and, and their uh, time of leadership overlaps. So the priest Ezra, under his leadership, the Jews rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem, tried to rebuild the wall and uh, stalled, they failed, they were being attacked by opposition. Twelve years later, Nehemiah is going to lead a third wave of Jews back to Jerusalem. So, a good question is, before we look at how Nehemiah got involved is why he got involved. What prompted Nehemiah to be involved in this incredible rebuilding 
project, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. Well, if you got your Bible, I'd like you to take it out and turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to go through the whole chapter, but in this first section, we want to look at what it was that prompted Nehemiah to get involved. Nehemiah 1 verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, that'd be the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, while I was in the citadel of Susa, one of the capital cities of Persia, Hananiah, one of my brothers, I believe this would have been a, a biological brother, likely he had returned to Jerusalem with uh, the priest Ezra. Well, he came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, and they are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I see two important lessons for us in this section of Nehemiah 1. First of all, uh, Nehemiah confronted the problem. Here we see his brothers and uh, uh, others in the delegation uh, visiting Nehemiah in Susa of Persia. We don't know why. Uh, maybe it was just a friendly trip. Uh, maybe it was a vacation. But what we know is, is that they did not have a good report. Uh, Nehemiah could have said, uh, I refuse to listen to this. I only want good news. Many people even today are conditional listeners. They listen to the point where they hear something they don't want to hear and then they just turn off. There are politicians who are like this. There are business leaders. Uh, there are even leaders in the church. Maybe you are even in a family where your spouse or another family member has that kind of habit. Uh, in dealing with a lot of uh, family of origin issues, I've, I've seen that play out where it's okay to talk about the good stuff, the blessings in life, but if you have a problem, you need to stifle it. It's not okay to talk about your problems out loud. In church life, uh, sometimes we uh, inadvertently uh, encourage people to mask their problems or keep that quiet. But for Nehemiah, he was willing to engage. He wanted to know about what was going on in, in Jerusalem. We can see here that uh, Nehemiah um, was increasingly aware that the walls had burned down. They burned down during Nebuchadnezzar's time, hundreds of years earlier, but it's very possible that uh, in Ezra's attempt to rebuild the wall, uh, opposition had uh, burned them down uh, halfway through the process. The people, ashamed and in disgrace. They've got this city, but no wall to protect them or to keep them secure. So Nehemiah was concerned, just as we need to engage to be concerned, and, and not to avoid problems, but deal with them right on. Uh, the other thing I noticed was that uh, Nehemiah was concerned about the issue. He was concerned about the problem. He confronted it and he was concerned. I love that phrase that when he heard this he he wept, he, he mourned, he fasted, but then he prayed. He wept over Jerusalem. You know it's interesting, Nehemiah was in a very prestigious place in Persia. Um, he was in a prominent position, but his heart was in Jerusalem. I find that even to this day. Though Jewish people are scattered around the world, it's as if God has placed within their hearts this desire and passion for Jerusalem. I personally believe that's going to play out in uh, eternity and as, as we move forward 
to God's uh, unfold in God's unfolding redemptive plan. So Nehemiah, though he was in Persia, had a heart for Jerusalem. He cared about what was going on to the point he wept for Jerusalem. Remember who else wept for Jerusalem? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, my question is, who or what do you weep over? Do you weep over Canada and the spiritual decay and the spiritual condition of our country? Do you uh, weep over uh, someone in your family? Maybe a brother or a sister, a son or a daughter who's away from the Lord. Do you weep for someone here at Byron Community Church who seems to have grown lukewarm in their faith? Do you even weep over your own spiritual condition? Now, I, I need to give you a caution. Um, weeping, this extreme emotion, isn't the only qualification for getting involved. There may be times where you don't feel a lot of emotion, but you know the right thing is to get involved. And so I want to encourage you in that. But for many of us, we need to say, Lord, soften my heart. I want to be like Nehemiah. I want to truly be concerned and passionate for the problems and difficulties people are experiencing around me. Oh God, make me sensitive. Make me increasingly concerned about what's going on. So all of this prompted Nehemiah to action. And we see that in verses 5 to 11. Simply put, Nehemiah prayed. This was his starting point. This was his priority for involvement. This gave him power and empowered the level of involvement that he was willing to be engaged in. So he prays in verse 5. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Three or four general observations about the prayer. Very quick, but I want to make these observations. Uh, first of all, what I appreciate about this prayer is this strong sense of it being the starting point. For Nehemiah, it wasn't a matter of rushing off to Jerusalem, getting involved, and then praying about it after the fact. For Nehemiah, prayer was his go-to approach. It's where everything needed to start. A second thing I love about this prayer is its solidarity. Solidarity, The way in which Nehemiah identified with the people. It's a personal prayer, but it's also a prayer of intercession. You've been in prayer groups where someone will pray, but it's just personal. You kind of go, I kind of wish you'd think about someone else and not be so selfish in your prayer. There are some people who are so intercessory in their prayer life, praying for others, but they avoid praying about their own needs and their own issues. We need that blend of personal and intercessory prayer. 
The other thing I appreciate about the prayer is how scriptural it is. Uh, I call this holy plagiarism. At times, Nehemiah is directly quoting from Deuteronomy. He's praying back to God his own word, kind of like Jonah did in Jonah chapter 2 when he was in the belly of the great fish. Uh, some of you have told me during the pandemic you've prayed Psalm 23, you've prayed out Psalm 91. I think this is a good habit. But more than direct quotation, it's being aware of the principles and the precepts in God's Word. That kind of scriptural approach. Then finally, this is a sustained prayer. The sustaining quality of this prayer. The, the fact is, is that uh, I read through the prayer in about a minute. Uh, but don't forget, Nehemiah had been praying day and night. This may be as a summary, uh, might be a culmination of all his prayers, but we have the confidence that uh, Nehemiah persevered. He wrestled with, he contended with God in prayer. So let's look at the big question. How did Nehemiah pray? It's like the disciples who said to Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. Uh, what did uh, Nehemiah do in his prayer? This classic prayer in Nehemiah chapter 1. Well, first of all, we see that Nehemiah acknowledged our great and awesome God. And when we pray, it's a wonderful starting point to acknowledge or to ascribe greatness uh, and power and, 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 and admit the fact that our God really is an awesome God. We should do that because God deserves it. God is worthy of our praise and our adoration. But also because we need it. You know, when you're in the middle of a problem, a difficulty, when life seems so uncertainty, we need to know that our God is bigger than the biggest problem. He is greater than the greatest difficulty. Our God is an awesome God. Uh, that word is overused, isn't it? Uh, the other day I had a piece of dessert. It was an awesome piece of dessert. Uh, maybe you saw the game the other night. Double overtime. What an awesome game. But awesome, in the sense we see here, is exclusive to God. He is awe-inspiring. We sing that Revelation song uh, about being in awestruck wonder, where our jaws drop, where our knees buckle, when we contemplate the greatness of our God. It's a wonderful place to begin our prayers. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, you should pray kind of like this, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name recognize the greatness and the wonder of our Heavenly Father. The second thing Nehemiah did is a bit of a surprise. It shouldn't be. It should always be part of our prayers. Is he confessed sin. Now what, what is surprising is that there are levels of the confession. Not only did, uh, did Nehemiah acknowledge his own sin, but he talked about the sins of his father's family, and then he took it to a whole other level where the sins of the Israelites. We see this uh, kind of identification, this collective guilt which leads to confession. Now I know these days that's a very, it's a very controversial issue, this whole notion of collective guilt. Uh, asking for forgiveness of the sins of our forefathers. But I admire Nehemiah for the solidarity, for the way he identifies. He could have said, hey, it's not my fault that there was sin during the time where King Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem. No, he, he identifies with it. He takes responsibility. And, and to me, the real key here is that Nehemiah acknowledges his own sinfulness, his own need for forgiveness. We live 
in a society that likes to blame others. We're really quick to do that and rarely uh, are we willing to assume responsibility for our sinfulness. Uh, there's a commercial on TV, I'm sure you've seen it, it's very popular, and uh, one of the segments there's two young brothers sitting in the bathtub covered from head to foot in paint. And the dad looks at them and says, whose idea was this? And the older brother, maybe about five, and I can relate, I'm an older brother, he kind of looks and points at his younger brother about three. And the younger brother is just shaking his head. Neither one of them willing to assume responsibility. It reminds me of the story of Adam and Eve. Okay, Adam, what's going on? What's happened? And Adam says, it's her fault. She made me do it. Blame Eve. Confession is such an important part of prayer. And I know we overlook it. We sometimes skip, skip over, but it's a critical part of an effective prayer life. So you've got acknowledging God's greatness, confessing sin. A third element, a third practice I see evident in this prayer is Nehemiah claimed the promises of God. We see that in uh, the very first part of the prayer where he, it says, God, you keep your covenant, your agreement with us, your promises to us. And then in verse 8 and 9, where Nehemiah is quoting from Deuteronomy, he says, yes, you told us that if we're sinful, this is going to happen, we'll be scattered among the nations, but if, if we return to you, you, we obey your commands, then you will gather us together into this place where you have chosen. Um, Nehemiah, very aware of the promises of God and claiming them. Now that word remember can be tricky. It's not as if God forgets the promises he has made to us. But in a relational, covenantal way, it means that God gives us permission. He invites us to claim the promises that are ours. He is saying, this is available to you. You follow these conditions, you will be able to enjoy the promises that I have made to you problem with a lot of our promises is they go unclaimed. Kind of like an unclaimed gift card. My guess is around your house or on your person there are many unclaimed gift cards. Maybe on a, 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 a dresser in your bedroom, maybe in your wallet, maybe in your purse. Now sometimes they go unclaimed because we go, am I ever going to use it? You know, you got that gift card to uh, indigestion cafe. I, I, I don't think that's a place that you necessarily want to go to. My guess is some of you like me, you know, come on confess it, we just talked about confession, are, are uh, prone to sometimes re-gift our gift cards. I bet you a couple of us have done that. But here we need to, like Nehemiah, claim the promises God has given to us. I will never leave you or forsake you. What a wonderful, what a wonderful promise in difficult times. Um, all things will work out for the good. You will grow in Christ. I'm, I'm in charge. I'm still in control. What a wonderful promise. There's even a promise about prayer. When we present a request with thanksgiving to God, he promises that he'll give us a peace that is greater than we could ever imagine, beyond our wildest speculations. That's a promise that we must claim. So when we pray, we should be aware and we should be persistently claiming those, taking God's promises for our own. There's over 3,000 promises in God's Word, so there's a lot of material for you to use. Finally, the final element I want to look at is going to sound so profoundly simple. Ask God for help. Um, supplication, this kind of requesting of, of, of God's help, his assistance, his rescuing, his deliverance, is always an important part of authentic prayer. 
what I note is that Nehemiah was very, very specific in his request. And for some of us, our prayers are way too general. And I know why that is. At times, we're sensitive to God's will and his sovereignty. We may go, I don't want to tell God what he should be doing, but boy, I look at Nehemiah and I go, like, he was pretty specific. Now, keep in mind, too, that Nehemiah had been praying for days. And prayer isn't just us talking to God, but hearing from God. And I believe that uh, direction and guidance he received from God translated into a very specific request. Oh God, grant me success as I uh, talk about a plan with King Artaxerxes that involves Jerusalem. Hey, did you notice that too? Nehemiah said, uh, when it comes to answering my prayer, oh Lord, I'm available, I'm willing to be part of the solution. It's like you have a neighbor and, and you'd love to see the neighbor come to Christ. So you pray, oh Lord, I pray for my neighbor's conversion. I pray that he will accept Jesus as his Savior and Lord. Oh Lord, do something about it. I pray he might turn on the TV and hear an evangelist. Or I pray that Pastor Josh will just one day randomly kind of uh, visit him. But it's quite another thing to say, oh Lord, I realize that I'm the neighbor. I realize that I have opportunity. You've likely put me in the best place to be the best person to reach out to this person. Nehemiah realized that in the scope of God's redemptive plan, God had placed him for such a time as this. And next week we're going to see how this plan materializes as we see Nehemiah demonstrating for us what a real leader looks like. For today, we focused on the priority and the power of prayer. It's where it begins when it comes to rebuilding the broken walls in our world, building brick number one with a bullet is prayer. Uh, we're going to pray as we close off this service, and may God bless you. So let us pray. I'm going to try to model this prayer after Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 1. Will you join with me in prayer? Oh God, you are great. You are mighty. You are an awesome God, worthy of our praise and adoration. Oh God, we thank you for eyes of faith that enable us to capture a glimpse of who you are. And God, we consider it a privilege to be able to come to you in prayer. And God, we think of how great you are, especially as we compare that to the problems and difficulties and the uncertainties we face. And we find it such an encouragement to know that we serve a great and mighty God. Oh, Father, we confess our sins. God, I start with sins in my own life, sins of commission, sins of omission. And, oh, God, you know our hearts, you know my heart. And, oh, God, I, I plead for forgiveness. God, I, I think of this church, I think of what we've done well, I think of other areas that we may have neglected. I just ask God again that you would forgive us and put us on the right track. Oh God, I think of our collective guilt as a, as a country, as a people. And uh, oh God, in any way where people have felt marginalized or even hurt by the church, oh God, we pray for forgiveness. Um, we pray for matters around social justice. Oh God, may we realize that it's so much more than a political correctness issue. May we capture your heartbeat in dealing with the poor and the needy. Oh God, I want to claim the mighty and great promises that you have given us. Uh, we thank you that you invite us to claim these promises and too often 
they go unclaimed. We are unaware. We're the ones who forget your promises. Oh God, we thank you that you have promised that you'll never leave us or forsake us. We thank you that you are in control. And we claim this promise that you are working all things for the good, uh, that we are being shaped and formed into the likeness of Christ. Oh God, we claim that promise of peace that you have promised to those of us who pray. God, we need a peace that will guard our hearts and minds, and we thank you that it's available to us, and we claim it today. Oh God, we ask for your help. We come to you asking for help, knowing that you're a God of grace as demonstrated and seen in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now God, I want to be very specific. Heavenly Father, I pray that there would be a vaccine that would help significantly with this pandemic. And I pray that it would be available by the end of the year. God, I pray that it would be safe. I pray that it would be scientifically tested. And oh God, we pray that it would be a, a mighty deliverance for the people of our land. God, I specifically pray for the teachers and students who are returning to school next week. Oh God, I pray that you would keep them safe. I pray for the teachers that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them discernment as they deal with these precious young lives. And I pray God for the students. It's been so hard for young children during this pandemic. Oh God, keep them safe. And for all the families that are opting to study online, who have kept their children out of school or daycare, oh God, I pray for them too. I pray God that you would give them increasing wisdom and help them as they determine what is best in their situation. And God, finally, I just would pray for this church. I pray that during the fall season, as we look at Nehemiah, O oh God, may his example enrich us. May we take seriously what you are teaching us through the life of Nehemiah. And O oh God, we could see even in the book of Nehemiah that it fits into your plan of redemption history, that everything points to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we thank you for Jesus. May we continually grow in him. May we appreciate that Christ in, a, in us is our hope of glory. We pray all of these things, approaching you with boldness and confidence because of Jesus Christ. For in his name we pray. Amen. And, you know, I think it would be really appropriate today, Josh, if... Uh, before you give us a couple of announcements that you would lead us through the Lord's Prayer. Will you do that, please? Maybe you want to join with me at home or just follow along as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Bow with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. Well, we are very excited that this week, the 13th, we are able to have in-person Sunday gatherings again. And we want to thank everybody who pre-registered uh, for this gathering. Now, if you didn't pre-register or you missed out on the 13th, registration will open for our Sunday morning gathering for September 20th. It will open on Monday and you can register by phoning the church or by visiting byroncommunitychurch.com and that registration window opens on Monday and the deadline is Thursday at noon. Please remember that registration is required if you want to join us for those Sunday morning gatherings. We want to thank you for joining us here on YouTube or on the podcast. We hope to see you again next week. Take care.